Good evening, good evening, good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Bible study on tonight. Our scripture tonight will come from Psalm 103. And it reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And what are his benefits? Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Help us sing the song that's called Bless the Lord. in the name of Jesus Christ we come. God, we thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come this far. We thank you for another chance, Father God, to honor your name, look at your word, admire your word, and learn from your word. Father God, we come now, Father God, thanking you, Father God, for this, your word. We thank you for another Bible study night. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you for giving us a mind, a heart, the ability to understand your word. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us tonight by way of your word, that we will take your word back and forth, and that people will be blessed because of your word. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Yes.
Thank you, Miss Sophia Galvan, for reminding us that we need to bless the Lord. Amen. Let's thank Sophia for being in Bible study tonight. She was, she was ran to get here. She was on fire to get here. She was so glad to get here tonight. Thank you, Sophia, for, for your diligence and Bible study. We are back in the saddle now. We are in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. I know it's been a while, and I know you have had the opportunity to look over, to review, and to study upon what we're looking at again tonight. We're in 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, and we will begin at verse number 12, end at verse number 16. 1 John chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. It's in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. God has afforded us one more again. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you to share, share on your device, share now, just put share now. And uh, let everybody in the world know that God is real and God is, is calling for us to love each other. Amen. So just share now for us, if you would. 1 John chapter 4, uh, we're talking about knowing God. We're talking about seeing God. We're talking about experiencing God. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 12. When we start off with 1 John chapter 4, we understand that the spirit of truth and the spirit of error are both on the scene at the same time. It talks about trying the spirit by the spirit. It talks about not obeying the spirit just because you hear from certain people. It talks about false prophets and they are among us even today. And the antichrist, the spirit of the antichrist is present. But it is our desire to understand that the greater one is in us than in the whole wide world. That's 1 John chapter 4. Verse number four, the greatest one, the greater one, is in us. Tell me, when do we use the word greater, and when do we use the word greatest? There's a different time that we use the word greater or the word greatest. English, English. When do we use the word greater? Are you mean in reference to God? No, when we use it in English. When do we use the word greater? And when would you use the word greatest? There's a difference, right? There's a difference. When do we use it? Do we use it at all? Or do we just throw whichever one out there we think? Yes, sir. Uh, greater, it's mostly a comparison between one and two. One is greater than the other. Yes, sir. Greatest, it's the greatest of them all. Okay. Okay. Everybody like that because you gave an answer. <laughs> and they figure they don't have to answer. So the first statement he made is absolutely true when you're comparing one thing against the other, right? So we use the word greater. If I have three sons, and I guarantee you that would never happen. <laughs> if I have three sons, and I want to talk about one being better than the other two, I use the word that is best, best, or the word greatest. If I have two sons and I compare one against the other, I use the word greater. So let me, so somebody tell me the law. What did I just say to you? The word greater is when you're comparing between two different objects or two different persons, two different things, you use the word greater. When you're comparing three or more then you use the word greatest. In the text, we are, being, we are comparing the spirit of God and the spirit of the devil. The greater one is in you. But when you talk about God, we know that not only is he the greater one, he's also the greatest one. So when we're comparing God to the devil or to the antichrist, God's spirit compared to man's spirit, or God's spirit compared to the devil's spirit, he is the greater one, and the greater one is in us. 
How did the greater one get in us? Is the greatest greater one in us? When we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit himself came in, and God the Father came in, and God the Father is greater than Satan. Okay? But because he's God, when you compare him with any other spirit, any other two spirits or more, he's the greatest. There is no God like our God. The greater one is in us. And then when you talk about three or more, he's the greatest. Questions or comments? Did I pay attention in English or I'm wrong? Speak out for I ever hold your feet. Okay, so we got the greater and the greatest. So the greater one is in us. Because we are comparing the spirit of the devil or the spirit of the Antichrist with the spirit of God. The greater one is in us. The greater one is in us. So then he talks about knowing God through love. He talks about yeah, knowing God by the way of love. He talks about knowing God by way of love. And when he talks about knowing God by way of love, what is he saying? He's saying God is love. And if we're going to know God, if we're going to know him, we must know him by way of love. If we're going to really know God, and if we're going to exemplify who God is, we have to exemplify love. So all the way to verse 11, he talks about knowing God. He who does not have love does not have God or does not know God. He who does not exemplify love has no knowledge of God. In reverse, what he's saying to us is because we know God, because the Holy Spirit is in us, because God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit walks with us, because he's present with us, then we are able to love. We know love. Love is forgiving. Love is kind. First Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, the greater of the three, the greatest rather of the three is love. When he compares three, we understand that there's one that is greatest. And that's love. If you want to really claim that you are of God, you do it by what you exemplify. And the question becomes, do you exemplify love? Or do you just love your folk? Do you just love your family? Do you just love those who do good to you? The greatest is the one who loves. Then we get to our pericope for tonight, found in 1 John chapter 12, verses, 1 John rather, chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. He begins by saying, no one has seen God at any time. Now, is John right? Can he be wrong? He is a man, right? Is John right that no man, no woman, no child have seen God at any time? No living human being has ever seen God. We have these pigmentations of our imagination of what God looks like. But God says that we should not create any graven image of who God is. We should not make a mockery or make any symbol of what God looks like. So it says, no man has ever, ever, ever seen God. But guess what? We have seen the visible image of God. And who is that visible image? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So if we have seen Christ, if we have experienced Christ, if we know the character of Christ, then we know God. We've experienced God if we experience Christ. No one has seen God at any time. Not only is Jesus Christ the visible image, 
John is going to tell us also that we can show forth God in ourselves. Look at what he says. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been perfected in us. If we love one another, is he talking to unbelievers, non-believers, or believers? So, 1 John, the Apostle John writes to believers. And as he writes to believers, he's saying to us that if we love one another, then people can tell that God abides in us. God lives with us. God dwells in us. God is a part of us. How? If you love one another. Jesus says this also. Jesus says... They will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love. Caring for. Affection. Loving people. And if we love each other, we won't harm each other. The songwriters say, I need you, you need me. We are a perfect family. He says to us tonight, if we love one another, God about he, he didn't say maybe, he didn't say might. He said, if you love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been perfected in us. This word perfected means that, that God is showing forth himself through us. Does it mean that we're perfect? The word perfected. Does it mean we're perfect? No? Yes? What does the word perfection mean? What does the word perfected mean? What's that word? Perfected. Yes, sir. Mature or made complete. To be mature or made complete, right? So God is, is making us complete and he is maturing us. And because we are mature, we are mature enough to love folk that hate us. Isn't that something? Jesus picks that thought up. Jesus says, Love your enemies. Do good to those that mistreat you, despitefully use you. Love. How many of you mature? How many of you love your enemies? How many of you pray for your enemies? I'm not talking about God kill them now. <laughs> One person will admit it. God, wipe them out. How many of you prayed for your boss? Prayed for your neighbors? Honestly prayed for them? Pray God, bless them. God, bless their family. Bless their children. Lord, bless their finances. God, cause your blessings to run my, my, my fours over. Run them down. Cause your blessings to chase them down. That's when you're praying. That's what Jesus is talking about when you pray for your enemy. He said, Lord, bless them with whatever they need. God, bless them with plenty. Lord, protect them as they go on dangerous roads. That's how you pray for your enemy. Can you take us? One person? Anybody? While they are abusing you, Lord, bless them. Jesus shows forth. Stephen shows forth. In Acts chapter 6, the deacons are created. They full of the Holy Spirit. You move to Acts chapter 7. Stephen walking around. He's one of the first deacons. He's walking around talking about Jesus. They crucify Stephen. Je Jesus stands up on the right hand of the Father. Stephen says, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Have we heard that somewhere before? Yeah. Jesus said, Lord, forgive them. For well, they know not what they're doing. And check this out. These two men are honestly, genuinely praying for their enemies. And not only are they praying for their enemies, they are praying for their enemies while they're beating them down and they're killing them and stoning them. Isn't that something? While they're crucifying them. That's what love does. 
That's what love does. So we as a church ought to be praying for the thieves. We ought to be praying, Lord, change their hearts. Change their minds. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Arrest them by way of your Holy Spirit. Let them not fall out with their evil ways. We ought to be praying for them. Because men won't work, they steal. Men won't work, they rock. And we ought to be praying. The Bible teaches that the reason why the world is in the shape it's in is because those of us who say we are godly people are not praying for others, are not praying for the world. You ever heard, if my people? The verses before that says, if I shut up heaven, no blessings flow. If I don't give you any cattle, if there's no, no herd in the stall, there's one thing that needs to happen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, yes, yes. then heaven will hear their prayer and will heal the land. Why is this land healed? Because God's people have not humbled themselves. God's people have not honestly prayed. God's people are not turning from their wicked ways. See, we are busy trying to turn other folk from their wicked ways. If we can just turn people to God, if we would just turn from our wicked ways, God, heaven would hear from us, and the land would be made new. Isn't that something? If we turn, we're, we're busy wondering when people are going to change. Let me just share with you when our hearts change. When our hearts are turned toward God. When God shows love being perfected through us. We have to be perfected. And God's love ought to shine in us. People will know that we are godly people when we have love, even for the wine or even for the prostitute, even for the criminal. When we have love, one for the other, and love for all the others who have no love for us. He says, by this we know that we abide in him. And he in us, because he has given us his spirit. By this love, not only will other people know it, but you will know it. So what's the litmus test here? Love. Not only is it, is it the litmus test for you, it's the litmus test for other people. And when you, when you find out and we, some of us have to find it out. You know, we don't realize it. When we get to a point where we realize that the Spirit of God abides in us, we know it because He abides in us, we abide in Him, and the result is love. Anybody got a neighbor that just get on your nerves? A neighbor that you just can't get past? No one? Okay. Anybody have a church member that just gets on your nerves? Anybody has a pastor who just gets on your nerves? Anybody? Just, just one person. So, yeah, man, you know any pastor that just gets on you, I mean, just, just rounds you? So, so what, can you name just one out of the seven? Oh, okay. Nah, 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 nah. By this, by this, verse 13, by this, we know by what? By love. We know that we abide in Him. And He abides in us. That's two different things. We abide in Him. Not only do we abide in Him, we abide in Him because of Him. You see, we didn't go and find Jesus. <laughs> Jesus found us because Jesus wasn't lost. 
We didn't give ourselves to him. He gave himself for us. It says, it says to us tonight that we abide in him and he abide in us because he has given us his spirit. God has given us his spirit and we ought to show forth his spirit. Love ought to just exude from you. Love ought to just flow from you. Love ought to be in your DNA. Do your co-workers see you as a loving person? When the boss misuse you, do your co-workers see you as a loving person? When the pastor makes a request and you just totally disagree, does your spouse, does your friend, does your your, your fellow uh, members of the church see you as a loving person. Or they see you say, mm. do you Do you really, really, really express love when, when your pastor asks you to do something you really don't want to do? He said, that's just such a loving man. I love him so much. One person, raise both your hands if you do. <laughs> My God. We got all unspoken here tonight. <laughs> we have the spirit of God. We have God's spirit. And we ought to act like God does. He's a loving God. How do you know? And this is not a rhetorical question. How do you know God loves you? How do you know that God has a loving spirit? And how do you know that God loves other people? Let's go around the room. Anybody. Who wants to stop? If we're going around the room, that means everybody can talk to him. So he gave his son for us. We have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. So we know God loves us, right? What why is there a benefit to have the Holy Spirit inside of us? Anybody? Why is that important? That's how you can experience God's love. Can I experience God's love? What else? What? Teaches us what God desires of us. What teaches us? The Holy Spirit. It does? He does. Oh, he does. The Holy Spirit, he teaches us, he leads us, he guides us, he directs us, he shows us the way. Well, why we don't listen? Do we listen? He's our leader, our teacher, our guide. He lives in us. Have you ever thought about a man living in you? Have you ever thought about that? One of my favorite characters growing up was the Incredible Hulk. In the Incredible Hulk, Lou Ferrigno lived on the inside of a little scrawny man. So, Phil, you ever heard of the Incredible Hulk? Mm -hmm. You said, man, that must be my past. I mean, poof. The, the, the incredible hump, Lou Ferrigno lived inside a little scrawny man. When did, when did, when did he become the incredible hump, though? What happened to make him become? Give me some of the ways you've seen him come into, turn into the incredible hump. Who's talking? Sophia, you talking? Pain and anger. Pain and anger. Any other thing made him become the incredible hulk? When somebody else is in trouble. Fear. Fear. When you have pain, when you have anger, when you have fear, when you have a lack of direction, the Holy Spirit is available to you. The songwriter says, he walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I am his own. The Holy Spirit is present. He's in us. He dwells in us. Somebody said that he came in when we received Jesus Christ as our Savior. Did he? Well, why people get in lines in Colosseums and receive the Holy Spirit? Why is that the case? Why, why don't you all get in that line and receive the Holy Spirit? I'm guilty. I got in lines. They used to have camp meetings. They used to have, have tent meetings. 
And as a little boy, maybe a teenager, I would go to those camp meetings. I had a heart for God. I would go to those tent meetings. And you, it's an amazing thing when you see a bunch of teenagers on the first 20 rows standing up, waving their hand and calling on Jesus. We all were sin sincere about what we were doing. But you need to understand, once you are saved, you don't have to go and have anybody's hand laid on you, no one to spit on you, no one to blow on you, just be saved. And when you are saved, the Holy Spirit comes in. He walks with me. He talks with me. Yes, and he tells me I'm his own. And most of all, he loves me. Yes. And if he loves me, will he direct me in the wrong way? Now back to my original question. Somebody, everybody was going around the room. How do you know? How do you know God loves you? I have two answers already. Three answers. Anybody else? Anybody else? The experiences you've had in your life. The good experiences. What about? Well, there were some things that were done that could only be him. Okay, so there are some things that, that happens in my life that only God can do. Who's next? How do you know the Holy Spirit is present? How do you know? Do you know? Are you sure? Anybody? How do you know the Holy Spirit is there? Has he ever spoken to you? Has he ever led you in the right direction? Has he ever made you feel miserable? I'm guilty. There have been times that the Holy Spirit just made me feel so bad. I mean, why? Okay, what time did he make me feel bad? Anybody? Sound like you're condemning me. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit calls us out. The Holy Spirit lets us know what we've done wrong. The Holy Spirit reminds us to no longer do wrong. He's in us. Verse 14. First John chapter 4, verse 14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. We know God loves us because he sent his Son. He sent his Son. Why is it important that he sent his Son? I just testified now. I was on my way to hell. The old preacher back home says, I wasn't fit to live and too stubborn to die. Wasn't fit to live and wasn't fit to die. The Holy Spirit, he's in us because of God's Son. God has given us, he has sent us his Son, the Father. It says, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Question. Has everybody been saved in the world? <laughs> Why, how you know? How you know everybody has been saved? Jesus has not returned. When Jesus returned for the church, will everybody have been saved? Everybody was going to be. Everybody was going to be. For that moment. So we know that God loves us because he gave us the very best gift. It was not a cheap gift. Was it a cheap gift? It was not a bad gift. It was not a mediocre gift. Jesus was God and still is God's best gift. He's not the better gift. He's God's best gift. God has given us his very, very best. 
given us his very best. So what should we give God? Our very best. Do we give God our very best? Why we don't give God our very best? What's wrong with us? Songwriter says, I love God, you don't love God, what's wrong with you? I love God, you don't love God, what's wrong with you? As if you there's something wrong with you because you don't love God. God has given us his very, very, very best. And he has given us his very best in his son Jesus. John 3.16 says that he gave us his only begotten son. This word begotten, his only unique son. God has given it to us. He has given us this gift, and this gift is his only begotten son. His name is Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, God's very best gift is in his son. You will never, ever, ever get a better gift than the gift of Jesus Christ. Some people would say, July 1st, 2000, was God gave me his very gift, best gift. I beg to differ. May 6th, 1980, <laughs> on a Tuesday afternoon, God gave me his very best gift. Some would say January 7th, 1991, God gave me his very best gift. I'd say, I beg to differ. May 6th, Tuesday afternoon, around 2.30 p.m., God gave me his very best gift. He gave me his very best. The, the, the writer, John, the apostle, John, says to us, the Father sent his Son as the Savior of the world. He is the savior of the entire world. He's not saying that the whole world has been saved, but when God gave Jesus Christ his best gift, he made it possible for the entire population of the world that has been, that will be, that is, to be saved. God gave it to you. The very, very best gift. God has given you his best gift. And we ought to give God our very best. Verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Look at what he says. He talks about the fact that if we are in God, God is in us in the first part of this pericope. And now he says, whoever confesses that Jesus is is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. What he's saying to us is, we can't abide in God, and God can't abide in us unless Jesus abides in us. Where there's no Jesus in your life, there's no God in your life. If God is in your life, that means Jesus is in your life. We walk around and we meet people on the street and say, hey brother, how you doing? Let me tell you, we are not brothers because of the color of our skin. We are brothers because Jesus is in our lives as our brother, as the Savior of the world, and God the Father is our Father. So we're brothers and sisters because of the Son. And as if God is in us, we are in God, the Son is in us, we are in Christ, and that's why we are brothers and sisters. And you know what? When we address each other, we usually address each other as brother and sister, right? Do we just use those terms and throw them around? We really mean it. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. Because we believe that we are in Christ together. Are you with me? Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. We must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. 
we must believe that Jesus has actually shown up on planet Earth already. He's already been here, Brother Miles. I just want to let you know. Matter of fact, he's been here, he's gone, and he's still here. Look at Jesus. There's no other brother like this brother. Jesus himself. He came, he left, he's gone, he's coming back, but he's still here. By way of the Holy Spirit, he's still here. He walks with me. He tells me he, that I am his own. And he is the savior, he is the deliverer, he is the one that keeps us and saves us from our own selves. He saves us from our sin. The Son of God, Jesus. I was teaching in a, a evangelism class in the 90s. And I was teaching, sharing the gospel. And I made the statement. If you are saved, if you say that you are saved, if you think that you are saved, and you, you believe that you got saved by any other means other than Jesus Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection, then you are not saved. Pretty bold statement, huh? The lady challenged me on that. And now Oprah is challenging me on that. Oprah wants to know, who are you? To say that there is no other way to heaven and no other way to God other than through Jesus Christ. She even goes on to suggest that there are other means or other ways to get to Christ. But I beg to differ. Jesus says in John chapter 10, I am the door to the sheepfold. Jesus says, no man come to the Father except through me. No man gets to heaven except through Jesus Christ. I and my Father are you believe in the Father, believe also in me. I and my Father are one. I go away to prepare a place for you. And people get into this argument. Well, how is God on planet Earth while he's still in heaven? Who's operating heaven while God is here? Remember, he's not a person. He's God. He's not a human being as we know him. He is the almighty God. He is God all by himself. There is no one, nothing like him. He is the greatest God of all time. See, Harvey was saying like this. When you talk about Jesus, he said he want to introduce Jesus. He said he headlines on every Catholic fan in every Catholic church. He says he walks on water without leaving tracks. His name is Jesus. It is the same Jesus that is the savior of the world. He's the deliverer. He's the one who keeps us. He saves us from our sins. He saves us from ourselves. Anybody need to be saved from yourself? Have you ever smelt yourself and you were really thinking? And I'm not talking about after a hard day's work. I mean your attitude stinks. stinks. Your sin stinks. Your personality stinks. And certainly our souls stink. And it's until we are saved that our souls will continue to stink. He's the savior of the world. He saves us. Whosoever confesses him, Jesus, that he's the son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. The word he is small, okay? So he's talking about us, right? God abides in us because of Jesus, and we abide in God. And there is no way to be in God without Jesus. Verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. We know and we believe in the love that God has for us. Stop letting men and women, boys and girls, tell you 
You are not anybody. Stop worrying about people being your friend as long as God is with you. God walks with us. He lives in us. And we know and we believe the love that God has for us. God loves you. Let me tell you, if a person is on the verge of suicide, I just say to you, God loves you. God loves you. God offers a wonderful plan for your life. God loves you. If people don't love you, God loves you. And he is the greatest love of all. God loves you. Isn't that something? But we get all bent out of shape when somebody says, I don't love you anymore. Well, first of all, you don't fall in and out of love like that. Even when we're wrong, God shows his love toward us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, while we were yet in the thick of our, our sins, while we were yet doing our own thing, while we were yet in sin, God demonstrated, God commended, God showed forth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, God sent Jesus to die for us. He loves us. Has somebody ever told you you're not worth it or you'll never be anything or, or God doesn't love you or they don't love you? I came to tell you today, God loves you. The next part of that verse says, God is love. God is love. Who is love? God is love. God's attributes demonstrate love. God's attitude demonstrates love. God's DNA demonstrates love. God loves you. God loves you and God offers a wonderful plan for your life. God loves you. Isn't that good news? When you're at your worst moment, just know that God loves you. When things are not going right, God loves you because God is love. When you down on yourself, when you know you missed the mark, remember if you confess your sin, you will be forgiven for your sin because God still loves you. Isn't that something? Because God is love. God is love. God is love. He loves you. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. God loves you because God is love. If you abide in God, God abides in you. If God abides in you, you abide in love. If God abides in you, then you abide in God. Because God is love. It says, it says, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. You know you, you, know you got God because you got love. What he's saying to us tonight is that we can't love in our own effort. We can't love in our own strength. We can't love in our own power. We can have fatuations. We can have lust. But if you really don't love, you need God. Because God is love. The only single way to get to God is through Jesus Christ. God demonstrates his love through Jesus Christ. And he keeps demonstrating it over and over again. When Jesus hung on that cross, he could have called legions of angels to take him down. He could have come down from the cross himself. But because God's love kept him down, he stayed there. What kept him there? God's love kept him there. It's Jesus' love for us kept him there. I just want to tell you God loves you. Amen. I want to tell you God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. Amen. I remember in Kim Song's, Kim Song's restaurant, after a hot revival, preachers go out and eat after a hot revival. Revival lasts all week long and we go out and eat all week long. 
We went to Kim Song restaurant. We were in Kim Song restaurant and, and, and I decided I was gonna go to the restaurant when I decided the other folks decided they were gonna go to the restaurant. About 12 of us sitting at the table and, and I'm, I'm in the restroom and when you go to the men's restroom, you see a lot of men facing the wall. They just standing there, they're not sitting on the couch, they're not talking, they're not having conversation. Men are standing in the restroom facing the wall. Brother was standing there facing the wall, guy was standing there facing the wall, I pulled up to him, I started facing the wall. And I used these same words. You know God loves you. He looks at me like crazy. First of all, men don't talk in the restroom. I don't care if we know each other or not. We don't spend any time. Just we don't spend any time in the restroom talking. Brother Gap, man, we don't, we don't go to the restroom talk. Matter of fact, if I say I'm going to the restroom, I think it's strange when somebody says, let me go with you. <laughs> Women do it all the time. I got to go to the restroom. Girl, let me go with you. We don't do that. So we're in the restroom, I pull up beside him, I say to him, I said, Brother God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. I said, have you ever heard of the four spiritual laws? Now we're in the restaurant. We're in the restroom of the restaurant. My first point to you today is God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. My second point to you today that you must individually receive Jesus Christ. You know I had to get in a hurry because we're standing there facing the wall. I said to him, God loves you. you. You must individually receive him as your personal savior. You can do that right now. And because God loves you, you need to know that Jesus bridged the gap between you and God. He died for you and he was buried for you and he rose for you. We in the restroom. Then I asked him, would you like to receive Jesus Christ right now? He bowed his head in Kim Song restaurant, all 59. In the third ward area, when third ward was third ward, he bowed his head in the restroom. He invited Jesus Christ into his life. I've never seen him before, and I had never seen I had never seen him before, and I never saw him again. And he didn't look like me. God loves you, and because he received Jesus Christ, I look forward to rejoicing with him on the other side. Lady asked me in one of my classes, well, was that the right place to witness? And then she went on through a pastor out there. My pastor said to me, there's a time and a place for everything. Was that the right place to talk about Jesus? So I asked the question, do you gossip in the restroom? Do you talk about folk in the restroom? Do you backbite in the restroom? I think it's a good place to talk about Jesus in the restroom. This man came to Christ, and now he knows God loves him. Now he knows that God is love. And God loves you in spite of what other people do, in spite of what other people say, in spite of who walks away from you. God loves you. When you go to sleep tonight, you can be assured that God loves you, and he loves you enough Regardless of what other folks do, he still loves you. And God's love is enough. He demonstrated his love by Jesus dying on a cross, being buried in a borrowed tomb, and rising from the dead. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You can get to know Jesus right here, right now. Just believe the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on Calvary, buried in a borrowed tomb, and rose from the dead. If this is you, just bow your head where you are and repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for your sin, for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for 
saving us. Thank God for being a part of us and we are allowed to be a part of him. God has blessed us again and we thank God for it. There may be those of you who are in between church homes or don't have a church home. This is your moment. I welcome you to the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. It's inbox us and let, you, let us know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church. We'll be glad to welcome you to the New Beginning Church. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your love. We thank you for expressing your love. We thank you for allowing us to be a part of your love. God, we thank you that you are love. Now, Lord, we ask you, Father, to bless us to go forth and show forth your love. That your love will be perfected in us. That we will be mature and that we will be complete through your love. That men will see our love one to the other and want to get to know our God. Bless us as we come to give through tithes, offering the sacrificial gifts. Bless us, Father God, as we give unto you as you have blessed us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. You can come now and give unto the Lord as he has blessed you. We're glad that God has blessed us to know tonight that he is love and we ought to be love and we ought to exemplify love. For those of you who want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your, your offering to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. you're the greatest one. Lord, we thank you that you're the greater one. God, we praise you tonight for just watching over us and keeping us. Lord, we pray that you dismiss us from this place and never from your presence. We pray, Father God, that you continue to walk with us and, and bless our lives. Now, Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless our church to be a beacon light for others to see. Protect our neighborhoods, protect our church, protect our people. 
Protect the bride of Christ, Father God, that we will always show forth love. We pray that you bless all these gifts that have been given. Lord, we pray for the choir as they come to sing unto you, not for practice, not for show, but to give you the glory. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion, until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. Amen. We are united in church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed.